Welcome to episode 43 of the Spotlight Games podcast. Today we have a cutie show for you. We're going to be giving our full review of Stray. We're going to be talking about some juicy news of the week like PSVR 2. The KOTOR remake is probably dead. Uh, and we're going to be asking for our topic of the show, the question, is it time to be worried about Ubisoft after all of their most recent delays i'm your host patrick joining me as always the handsome bachelor my sweet dumpster boy cayman darty cayman how are you feeling i assume you must still be hung over after this last weekend god yeah man i the older i get the the longer my hangovers last and <laughs> in this particular situation yes still hung over and uh that's uh i stopped drinking on uh sunday so sure did you have a, a good weekend, though? We had mentioned last weekend uh, your bachelor party was this weekend. I, unfortunately, was not able to make it because I'm a terrible man afraid of COVID. Uh, but it looked like you guys had a blast. We did. We had a good time. We had a very good time. Uh, I was belligerently drunk for <laughs> about 48 straight hours. Great. I would have expected nothing less. If, if you told me anything different, I would have been a little disappointed. Um, well, we have a, a thick show, so let's jump into some housekeeping, talk about Save Trash Cinema, and then let's get into it because we have a lot of video game stuff to talk about because this is the Spotlight Games podcast where each and every week we're going to spotlight the latest and the greatest in the world of video games. You can get it by subscribing to our YouTube channel or by searching for Spotlight Games in your favorite podcast app. And hey, you can be on the show just like we have someone in our live Twitch chat right now. Twitch.tv slash Spotlight Games Pod. Be sure to give us a follow there so you know when we go live. But I can go ahead and tell you, we're going to go live every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern uh, to record the podcast. And you're going to be able to listen to or watch the podcast every Thursday at 8 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, or, you know, later in the week whenever you want to. Cayman, tell us and the good folks at home about the most recent episode of The Trash Cinema and how we're saving it. Yeah, absolutely. So this week's Save Trash Cinema episode is live currently for you, and we are interviewing the absolutely wonderful power couple, Alex Austin and Keir Seward. Uh, they are directors, they are writers, they're editors, producers, they're the whole nine yards, and they're about to release their first feature-length film, Kill Your Lover. And we talked to them about pretty much everything from jumping from short films to feature length. We talk about body horror. We talk about uh, soul sucking <laughs> leeches. And we just talk about how movies are made. Uh, how, how the, what, what is it? How the bread's made. What how the, it? how the sausage. I think, how I, the believe sausage it's, I think it's sausage. I think, I think that's right too. Yeah. So that's how we do it. And I'll go ahead and give you a little sneak peek for next week. Since we've already recorded that episode too. Uh, we will have Kier. See, we're back on. Um, where we will all come together and we dissect uh, the 1981 film, The Burning. Uh, the Burning. And it is a fantastic episode, a lot of really good laughs, and a lot of behind the scenes on some very interesting things that you would never think of when um, watching a movie. And sure. so a little edutainment thrown in the mix. And honestly, I think both are fantastic episodes. So if you haven't listened yet, please go ahead and do so. It's live right now. You will enjoy it. Live now, buy now, listen now. Uh, let's jump into what we're playing. And before we do it, let's say hey to a friend of the show, Toon, in the chat. Hey, Toon. Uh, how you doing? Love your new episode that just came out a few days ago. Uh, go check out Games University Podcast. But let's talk about what we're playing, Cayman. I know you had a busy weekend, but what have you been playing, if anything, other than yeah. the game of life? So I, yeah, so the game of life, yeah. So um, like I said, I've been very busy boy. And I was lucky enough to be able to sit down before we recorded and knocked out about two hours of stray. So I have some thoughts, but I want to hold those until we hold hear em. some more for yours. Hold what em. have you been playing outside of stray? So I, uh, because I stayed home this weekend, I just played a fuck ton of video games. I, uh, I beat As Dusk Falls on Xbox. Okay. Uh, and I started playing Escape Academy. Only very little, though. I think I'm going to save Escape Academy for next week because I'll have a lot more to say on Escape Academy next week. But I do want to talk about As Dusk Falls. Um, famously, for those that watched our reacts to the Xbox showcase, we both were like, this looks like dog shit. And then it surprised the hell out of us with nine out of 10 reviews from a lot of reputable places. And I, if I were to give it a number, 
I would give it like somewhere between a three and a four out of five or like a seven and eight out of 10. Um, it's a really compelling story. I think uh, they really nail the that like uh, what we have come to kind of always associate with Telltale that story decision making gameplay where there's a bunch of branching paths. And I do feel like this is one of those games where I feel like we've been saying this a lot more in recent months with these kinds of games where I do feel like the decisions matter. Mm. One of the issues that Telltale always had was I always felt like some of the stuff in the middle things would change, but it always kind of ended at the last or like the kind of the main one or two storylines. This one does seem like there are a lot of different outcomes across the, the various characters. Um, the story is really interesting. It, it follows these two families in um, Arizona. One is a family that's like traveling through and another is this family who there's like a heist gone wrong, essentially. Mm -hmm. And it all culminates in this hostage situation at a motel and the fallout from that and, and all that kind of stuff. And while I thought the gameplay at times uh, there isn't really any other than there's the occasional swipe left, swipe right, tap a circle the stick um, there. It's not like telltale like you're not walking around. Um, because the art style is like a watercolor stop motion style. And so that is also my biggest complaint with the game is it feels like because of its art style, while it's very pretty, it felt like, I don't know. It just, it broke the, the um, illusion for me a lot because it seemed like I was just looking at a picture that had been traced by watercolors. Um, and so there's a lot of like kind of breaking of, of the, not the fourth wall, but I think, you know what I'm saying? Like I, it broke sure. the illusion a lot of the time. So I would say if you have game pass and you like a, a good story driven game, and if like if you've played Telltale type games before, Life is Strange, uh, it's a lot less gameplay than those games, but same kind of style with the storytelling, um, choose your own adventure type thing. So I enjoyed it. I would recommend it on game pass. Um, uh, so yeah, as us falls pretty good. And then came in and then, I have yes. been playing and finished stray. So why don't we jump into our full on stray review? Let's look at this sweet, sweet cat running around while we talk about it. I want to hear your thoughts first since you're about two hours in. What, what are you thinking so far? Yeah. Um, I think that the world building is very interesting. And I think that's where the game is highlighted so far. Puzzle wise, there's really not much to the puzzles. Everything is pretty cut and dry. Everything feels kind of simple. I will say I am slightly lost. Um, I'm still in the, like the very first hub area of the game. Uh, and I'm assuming there, there's probably going to be more areas like the slums or whatever. Yeah. I'm in the yeah. slums still. And I'm a little bit lost because I definitely did things out of order. Um, and like sure. went and like did some other things and then like, was like, Oh shit, here's where I need to be. Um, and then it was like, Oh, well you've already done three of the four, but where's <laughs> the fourth one? I'm like, yeah, I have no fucking idea. And I'm like, yeah. Oh, that makes more sense. It would have told me if I did this in order, that's a little bit of a gripe uh, outside of that. I think it's, it's really cute. Um, playing as a cat's pretty cool. Uh, definitely reminds me of the cats I have, which are just kind of assholes. Like this cat definitely <laughs> just knocks everything over and just makes a mess out of everything, which yeah. is about right. Um, I think my biggest complaint so far is it doesn't feel as fluid mm. as I want it to feel. Like it, I just don't feel like like the, the mechanics, especially around the cat itself, like being like, oh, you can't just jump. And I get why they build that in where it's like, yeah, because if you can, you just jump off a building and die all the time. Sure. It's like, that makes sense. But like, there's moments where like the cat will be angled a certain direction. All of a sudden kind of just like kind of jank a little bit and then yeah. like jump the opposite direction. I'm like, that kind of breaks the immersion from me or, or for me. And so uh, ultimately though, I, I think that I'm intrigued enough. I will continue to play this game. Um, I'm not as big on on puzzles and things like that. Uh, puzzle games but ultimately i think that that i will finish this game i i will say i did see uh brian english from ps5 trophies he was complaining about one trophy in particular and was like this one trophy is going to piss off a lot of people is and it the time that beat it in two hours no actually apparently that's not hard to do it's the there's a trophy right off the beginning of the game where you get into a chase sequence 
and you what cannot, we're looking at right now yes actually you, you cannot like get hit or like you cannot be stuck by any of these like mutant rat things um huh. and so it's like a pair a lot of people are like this is a very frustrating trophy it took me like six tries um and it's so fast on the ps5 that like restarting the checkpoint was super easy and so i like went through it took about six tries i was able to knock it out i was like oh I, that's not hard at all actually sure uh, it was a little like, what the fuck is going on? But then, like, <laughs> yeah. Once I kind of figured out, like, one point in particular, I just kept getting hit. I was like, maybe if I do this differently, it'll work. Yeah. And it did. And so I was like, oh, okay, well, that's not that bad. I- I'm totally fine with this. Um, but, yeah, I-, I think I think I will enjoy the game. I definitely think I'll beat it. I've heard it's not very long. Um, Platinum-wise, I guess it'll really just depend on when I beat the game. Sure. Like, what I think about doing the Platinum. Um. But the what always gets me about games like these with a platinum with a speed run that's very puzzle heavy is that I suck at puzzles. Yeah. And so I will will most likely have to like really work to like make sure I get knocked out. But yeah, I think it's I think it's fun. I know you've beaten it though. Do you think yes. this is a game that you would go back and platinum or have or you already platinumed it? So I have not platinumed it. I as I was going through, I was kind of keeping an eye on the trophies, uh, and there's one. I'm surprised I missed it. There's this one trophy where, uh, which is actually one of my favorite parts of the game. Uh, so to preface all of this, I'm a I'm a big cat guy. I used to be a dog guy, and then Rose, my wife, was like, "Let's get a cat," and I was like, "No, I'm allergic," even though I wasn't really. Uh, and then we got cats, and I fell in love, and now we have three, and it's a problem. But Something that I think is so cute about this game is that there's this trophy in every chapter it, uh, as Stray. It wants you to like scratch and like mark your territory. And I thought I got that one and I didn't. I must have missed one of the first chapters where you can scratch on things. Um, so just anecdotally, like there's that's one I know I already missed. I think I ended up getting like 60 or 70 percent just by beating the game. Um, I might go back, but it actually want to kind of jump ahead to one of my gripes with the game is i i don't see much replayability with this Mm. game and and i think one thing that they could have done to make it feel a lot more replayable is let you customize stray um someone who has three cats like i totally would have gone through this game three times if one time i could go as george one time i could go as gus and one time i could go as joe but i can't i'm only ever stray um and i understand the creative choices as to why they did that they had a cat that they kind of based this off of and they wanted to tell their story as this one cat but i think it's a big missed opportunity to not let me run this game as gus and let him be a little chonkster uh but i understand the the struggle there um quick pause to say hey to kayla in the chat uh she uh jk games podcast friend of a show uh has been playing Jerrica, also a friend of the show from JK Games, has finished it, really enjoyed it. Um, and she says she's not even going to attempt the Platinum. Um, but but yeah, so I, I loved this game. Uh, I played the whole thing with Rose, and um, I think what they set out to do, they nailed. Mm-hmm. I think, I felt like I the feeling of playing as a cat, I thought they nailed. Like one of your, your, your uh, complaints with not being able to jump I actually really liked their jumping mechanic, which is just, it's like a magnetic. If there's something I could jump onto, I press X and I go to it. I don't have to like, I'm not jumping at will. I I enjoyed that because it felt like, especially in times when you're running away from those little fucking rat aliens. If I just hold X, Stray will jump whenever he needs to jump. So it, it kind of, for me, it simplified that to where, it was more so about exploration and like feeling like you're a cat as opposed to a video game where you happen to be a cat. If that makes sense. It feels like it's splitting hairs, but it really worked for me. Um, And I liked how there's only specific things you can do in terms of like, you can only jump on specific railings and specific, like the, the entire uh, world isn't, climbable jumpable like it might be with a real cat i appreciated that they made the choice to to make it a little linear in that way um and to jump off of another thing that you had said with that opening the the slums that first area i felt that way at first for sure where one of my my complaints was i felt like it needed a map yeah and by the end of the game i kind of went back on that because i i feel like it's just small enough 
to where there were times where I was really afraid, especially in the slums, where I was like, if this gets any bigger, I'm going to start getting really overwhelmed with where to go because I, I can't track where I'm going. But there is one more location like the slums that's a little bit bigger than the slums. But the way they build it, I think, is really smart, where it's almost like everything kind of there's like a central point to both of these mm -hmm. areas. And then it's basically just like streets going off of this central point. So you can almost just street. I, I treated the central point as like the center of a clock and would just kind of like, okay, I've done this quarter. I've done this quarter. I've done this quarter to kind of make sure I'm not missing areas because I think if it had been any bigger, I would have started getting really frustrated with sure. there not being a map. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, I, I totally see where you're at and I'm interested to hear like next week when we chat about it, if you still feel that way, because I had a similar situation in the second open world section where I did what you're doing right now, where I had like found all these things cause I was just exploring. And then I finally was on track with the mission and the mission I ended up finishing like immediately because I had already done all the legwork unintentionally. Um, I, there were a, a couple questions that we had had, um, uh, I'd put out that we were going to do this. I wanted to address some of those. If you would have me, Cayman. Sure. Um, we've talked about one of them kind of already, which is how does it feel to be the cat? I think they nailed it. There's a lot of really little things like making biscuits, getting in boxes. Yeah. You can get a little bag on your head. Sure. And when you yeah. do that, your uh, the controls are like all reversed, which I thought was yeah. really funny. Was uh, so there's, there's a lot of really little things like that. And there's a lot of really cute things like you can just nap there are certain parts where you can just sit down and nap and there's a trophy to nap for an hour, which I haven't done that one yet. Um, so that part I thought they really, really nailed was it. The, the little cat nuances, the cat isms I thought mm -hmm. were, were really good. Sure. Um, there was another question about the story. Uh, how is the story? And is there much of one? I would say, obviously I don't want to spoil anything because um, it's a pretty short experience. I think the story was enough for me i think there is enough of one there that it felt like i had a purpose and it felt like i was doing these things for a reason as opposed to i'm just trying to beat this video game without being too much of one i think it could have could have gone way too far with story um you have this little companion with you this after a certain point you have this companion with you and i grew to really love this little companion i've seen a lot of people online talk about how they felt like the story was more so um like they it did a lot of telling and not a lot of showing i didn't agree with that i felt like the way they presented their story i got really attached to these characters and i i understood all the stuff about it. And, and I was really invested, um, but I could see potentially not vibing with it as much. Mm -hmm. I think I will say, I think a lot of my opinion on this game is really biased by the fact that I just fucking love cats. I think if I yeah. wasn't a cat guy, I could be a, not yeah. down on this game completely, but I could definitely not be as high on this game. Yeah. So game. for me, story-wise two hours in, uh, it, it feels more like breadcrumbs. Yeah. Uh, than it does anything else. Like it, there's no real narrative yet. Yeah. Now that could very, you're much about change. to get more narrative. Okay. It's not a ton more, but you're about yeah. to get like, there's going to be more of a purpose very soon for you right now. You're definitely still in the like exploration. Like what, what is happening type stage of the story uh, for sure. Um, last thing I did want to mention, there was one other question. Is there any combat in this game? You had briefly mentioned this a little bit. There's no combat per se. It's just like platforming sequences of escape more so mm -hmm. than combat. There is some stuff later in the game, uh, which was a little frustrating. It's another one of my my few complaints with the game. There's uh, It goes very stealth heavy in like one section specifically of the game. And I just didn't have a lot of fun with that part. Um, I felt like it was a little too easy to fail. Mm. Um, and... It's very much like think of any stealth game where there's like things uh, going around that are like trying to to catch you essentially. So you're trying to get through this area without being caught. And I just I'm not a huge fan of that type of gameplay. Sure. Like I like stealthy games. I like Hitman. I like Metal Gear. But in this setting, it just felt a little uh, forced to me. Mm -hmm. um, but so no combat. But there is a little bit of like it's more than just exploring this world as a cat. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, 
those are, I would say overall, like if you're interested in this game at all and you have the ability to play it, whether you have a PlayStation or a PC, I think you should play it. I think it's really, really good. Um, now, if you fucking hate cats, probably not going to like this game. Probably not going to like this game one bit because you're probably going to be like, I hate cats. Why am I a cat? But if you fucks with cats, I think you'll fucks with Stray. Hell yeah. So, so yeah, if you have any other questions, if you're playing Stray, uh, let us know what you think. I know there are a few people in our audience that are very excited uh, about it and wish they had a PlayStation to play it and don't. So uh, at some point, maybe I'll have a stray party. We can all just play stray together. Um, any final thoughts from you? Okay, uh, none yet. Definitely. I've that will change next week. Uh, hopefully after I beat the game. Um, so I'll have more thoughts then, Sweet. but as of right now, I think uh, I just need more time. Cool. We need more time, folks. We need more time. time. Well, I'll tell you who might need a little more time, Cayman, unfortunately, even though I don't think they're going to be getting more time, is The Last of Us. So uh, over the weekend, we got... Um, oh, wait, it's not showing the right thing. Hold on. Um, we got a new look, a deep dive, as it were, into The Last of Us Part 1. Um, over the weekend, there was some concerns from a leaker that this game apparently just feels like the last of us part one and that there's been no changes to the gameplay. And so uh, late on Friday, very late on Friday on the PlayStation blog, uh, they released this 10 minute video and kind of gave us some insight. So we're going to go through that and then, then we'll discuss it. So this is from Sid Schumann on the PlayStation blog. Sid writes, the last of us part one on PS five will feature a host of gameplay and presentation enhancements that will bring the game closer to its original vision. According to co-president Neil Druckmann. While The Last of Us Part 1 can render native 4K at targeted 30 frames per second or dynamic 4K at targeted 60 frames per second and features PS5 mainstays like DualSense, wireless controller haptics, trigger effects, 3D audio, it's clear that there's a lot more going on here than a simple resolution and frame rate bump in its, comma, it's a complete overhaul. From the art direction to the character models, the entire game has been rebuilt from the ground up to take advantage of a new generation of graphical capability, allowing this game to reach the visual fidelity that the studio aspired for when crafting this experience. The PS5's powerful hardware drives a host of visual benefits from denser physics with tons of bumpables and chippables. Bullets can now rip apart concrete and environmental objects, and cinematics now transition seamlessly to gameplay. Motion matching technology means that character animations flow more convincingly, intuitively, and realistically all adding another layer of believability to characters and their interactions with this world. Further, AI upgrades means that this, uh, the characters inhabit the world in a more authentic and realistic way, such as buddy characters navigating cover to avoid NPC sightlines more authentically. Uh, the enhancements are all in the name of increasing the game's immersion, but the improvements don't stop here. Naughty Dog worked with their community to integrate some fan requests, including a permadeath mode, a speed red focus mode, and a host of brand new unlockable costumes for Joel and Ellie. The game also hosts 60 plus accessibility options, outpacing what the developer was able to offer with The Last of Us Part 2, and includes a new audio description mode, ensuring that play is rewarding and inclusive for all. Cayman... What are your thoughts hearing this? It definitely sounds like PlayStation is trying to kind of pump up what these features are, maybe a little more than they actually are. It's, it, they're making it, they're saying it's it's more of a change than I think maybe it is, but where's your head at? Like, does this do anything for you either way in terms of, of this remake? I mean, sure. I think everyone was kind of hoping, especially with the price tag of $70, like everyone was hoping that there would be something more to the game. Um, I was partially hoping that maybe they would have figured out a way to include um, some just additional content, you yeah. know, whether it be, you know, giving Sam's story a little bit more background um, opening up the worlds a little bit more for exploration, things like that. I kind of hoped that that would have been there, but I wasn't expecting it. And I think this is part of the issue is a lot of times is we have expectations in mind. Um, and then when we don't get what we specifically think we should get, we yeah. get angry. I Ultimately, as long as the, is it tweaks the gameplay enough to make it feel a little bit more like The Last of Us Part Two, in the sense that it just feels smoother. Then I think that's fine. Yeah. Um, I think that there's a lot of people that are like, no, 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 no. We need an entirely new game. And like, 
I, you know, once again, I all, I understand where, and a lot of it just boils down to the price tag. And for me, ultimately, I'm like, ah, fuck it. Just, just let's get the game out, guys. Also, everyone yeah. just needs to learn to shut the fuck up. <laughs> like, I really, like, I don't know what yeah. else to say outside of, like, people just need to learn to shut the fuck up. Yeah. It's, they think that because they have a thing called the internet or a thing called Twitter, that immediately they, their voice, their opinions now matter more than everything else in the entire world. Yeah. And it's like, no. It really doesn't. And honestly, I feel like having a platform probably shouldn't exist. <laughs> um, just like people are way too entitled. I think a lot of these adjustments are really cool. Um, I think it'll be exciting to play the game again with a fresh coat of paint. Um, is it a day one purchase for me? Probably. Um, could I hold off? Yeah, I can. Yeah. yeah. And having a wedding I'm paying for, I probably should. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I, um, I mostly, I mostly, I, I'm pretty aligned with you. I, I do. I would be lying if I said I wasn't a little disappointed that this isn't going to feel more like the last of us part two, but I think the cynics when this was first announced was like, Ellie is just a, she's a different person. Of course she's, it's not going to feel the same. Joel is an older, slower guy. They're not going to make you feel like Ellie from the last of us part two. And I really hoped that they would, I would hope that they would bring the prone gameplay where you can jump on the ground and, and things like that. But I think it, at that point, it would be more of like a reimagining of the game than a yeah. remake. And, and, and also like my, my first response before this, when the leak came out it was just like, it's just, just last of us part one with better graphics. I was pretty disappointed, but then watching this and seeing how much of this they focused on accessibility. I think that's a huge win like that alone. There was a, there was an entire audience that couldn't play The Last of Us Part One that could play The Last of Us Part Two, and now those folks can now also play The Last of Us Part One. So that's a huge win for me. Um, and and I also think like it's it's cool how much they're putting into the AI as well. Yeah. So there was a there were a couple days there where I thought maybe it won't be a day one for me, but like I will pick this up eventually. But after watching this and and reading more about it, I do think it's back to a day one purchase for me. Uh, I'm just I'm not through the roof excited anymore knowing sure. that this is just going to be the last of us part one that just feels a little better and looks a lot better um yeah so i agree yeah uh so yeah let us know what you think if this changes your uh feelings at all on the last of us um but uh cayman there's a game that i know you're excited for it's true that we have some reviews for so why don't we do a little reviews roundup for live alive yeah, absolutely. So this first review, or I guess this only review, it's going to come from a Rebecca Valentine over at IGN who gave it a 9 out of 10. Uh, Rebecca says, worth mentioning, oh, sorry, worth mentioning the review subheadlining is live, laugh, live. Oh, I love that. I thought that was Which really is great. Uh, yeah, but the actual review itself says, Live Alive is a fascinating piece of JRPG history. That's more than worthy of the energy Square Enix has spent to remake it for a global audience with a beautiful new art style decades later. Its unusual vignette, structure, and lovable ensemble cast are a delight to spend time with, especially thanks to the addition of voice acting. And the ultimate story payoff remains surprising and stand out among JRPGs even decades after its original iteration. Its seven different characters each make inventive and surprising use of the deceptively simple combat system, which adds even more flavor to the most challenging optional boss fights. The remake could have put a bit more work into mitigating some of the original's more tedious grinds toward the end, but by the time that grind kicks in, live, live, live alive, um, had enough hooks stuck in me that I couldn't put it down until I jammed out to Megalomania for the final time. I'm very excited about this game. This it yeah. looks beautiful. I uh, you know I don't even know if there's anything worth saying anymore. Everyone knows I love JRPGs. Oh sure. And so it's like fuck it. Like I'll have a review coming soon. Don't worry. Perfect. Yeah, I this was a game like I we've talked about it several times. I was like excited, but I never got to the point where I was like I can't wait for this. But now that it's out and it's getting incredible reviews. I'm like, okay, I'm really excited for this game now. I can't wait to jump in. Uh, and looking at this, like the B-roll for it, oh, it looks so pretty. It, it just looks... It look, yeah, it looks so yeah. good. So definitely, I, I, I'm really looking forward to this one. I know uh, Nick, friend of the show, uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, he will be giving us some thoughts very soon. Uh, so maybe next week, when after if you've been playing it, and maybe we'll, we'll do a little, little audience featurette 
on uh, on what Nick's been thinking. Um, but hey, we have another review roundup from uh, Xenoblade Chronicles Three, one of my Cayman games in the Fantasy Critic League. Currently sporting an 87 on Oprah Critic. You know, I like oh, that. Hell yeah. uh, this is coming from Jacob Decker at GameSpot. Um, this is an 8 out of 10. Jacob says, Xenoblade Chronicles 3 feels like the game Monolith Soft has been trying to craft for years. While its dialogue could have used an extra pass, it more than makes up for it with its wonderful story and superb combat. It's rare for a JRPG to hold my attention for a 100-hour runtime, but Xenoblade Chronicles 3 did it with confidence. Came in... How, what, 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 give me, you know, on the excitement level, uh, radar, where are you right now? So I got, I got, I'm on both ends, right? On one end, like I enjoyed Xenoblade Chronicles. I just enjoyed the series. I was a little bit like, eh, you know, just with all this other stuff going on, maybe this isn't a game I want to play immediately. Scores come out, reviews come out and I'm like, holy shit. Okay. So this is definitely a game I want to play as soon as I possibly can. However, I have a wedding in October. <laughs> and yeah. what that means is I'm going to be a very busy boy. Oh, yeah. Buzz, buzz. And a 100-hour runtime terrifies the ever-living shit out of me. Because I agree. Actually, that's exactly where I'm at, other than the wedding. Yeah, I and that's like something like Save Charge Cinema. We've been really picking up some steam. We've been getting a lot of really cool guests on, so I've been doing a lot of extra interviews. And so like that takes up more time. And just a lot of extra work that we're putting in on top of the wedding, on top of the fact that we've had the bachelor's party, we've had all these things happening. And I'm like, I don't know, man. I don't, this used to excite me. Yeah. Things would be like, oh my God, a hundred hours. Give me a hundred. Now we'll say, and here's the huge caveat here. Give me a caveat. A hundred hours on the switch. Not as bad. True. A hundred hours on the PlayStation five or the Xbox that's where things get a lot trickier because now I'm taking up TV time. Great point. And so that's a little bit of a hassle. However, this game, just like the other ones, I'm assuming is going to have like some really good moments of grinding, some really fun dungeons and some really, like incredible combat. So on the switch, pop on the TV blown away. Season three is currently out. So, you know, I'm watching my glass blowing. Oh yeah. Oh, just I imagine know, watching I my glass, watching my glass blowing. Playing some Xenoblade Chronicles three, that sounds fantastic. Come on, dude! Like, so, what a you know what, what I'm what I'm expecting is is you're gonna get into the game right around the time of the wedding, and while we're like getting all ready and stuff, and we're having like the boys together because you're you're one of my groomsmen. We're gonna all the boys are together. We're getting ready for the wedding, and I'm just gonna look over, and you're just gonna be like this on your switch, face down, just fucking just legs ride, up, legs, legs up, up, switch right there. Just oh yeah. Going to town, just with going to town. Yeah, I've. That's what I foresee happening. Maybe, I hope Maybe. so. We'll see. I, All yeah. right. You know what? I'm not going to be playing. Came in. Oh boy, I'm taking the reins on this <sighs> one because I need you to 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 save your. I voice. need to simmer for a minute. You need to yeah. absorb what's about to happen. Save yeah. your voice because shit's about to get real. Hold me. This comes from Jason Schreier over at Bloomberg. The Kotor remake paused indefinitely. <sighs> He says, a hotly anticipated new Star Wars game is in serious trouble, according to people familiar with the project. Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, a remake of a 2003 role-playing game, is delayed indefinitely, as developers at Austin, Texas-based Aspir Media try to figure out what comes next. Aspir also abruptly fired the game's art director and design director this month. In a series of meetings throughout July, Aspir's two studio heads told employees that the project is on pause and that the company will look for new contracts and development opportunities, said the people who are not authorized to speak publicly about the situation. Knights of the old <laughs> Knights of the Old Republic was to be one of the first modern Star Wars console games released outside of Electronic Arts, which had previously held the exclusive licensing rights. The deal expires in 2023, opening the door for new Star Wars games from outside companies like Aspir, Ubisoft, uh, Quantic Dream. You know, all those guys that are in trouble. Uh, the game was announced last September and has been in development for nearly three years at Asper, which was purchased by Sweden's Embracer Group AB last year. Asper's founded in 1996, was best known as a service shop that brought existing video games to other platforms such as iOS, including the original Knights of the Old Republic games. On June 30th, Asper finalized a demo of the game, 
known as a vertical slice to show the production partners Lucasfilms Limited LLC and Sony Group Corp. The developers were excited about it and felt like they were on track, according to a person familiar with the project. So they were shocked by what happened next. The following week, the company fired design director Brad Pence and art director Jason Miner. Neither responded to requests for comment, but Miner suggested on his social media page that his dismissal was unexpected. Aspire studio heads told staff that the vertical slice wasn't where they wanted it to be and that the project would be paused, according to two people who were in the meeting. One person familiar with the discussion suggested that a disproportionate amount of time and money had gone into the demo and that the project's course wasn't sustainable. Another point of contention may be the timeline. At the outset of development, Asper told staff and partners it would release the game by the end of 2022. According to two people familiar with production, developers said a more realistic target now would be 2025. The fate of Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic remains unclear. In May, Embracer announced that Saber Interactive would also join the project. Some at Asper believe that Saber, which has mainly been doing outsourcing work for the project, may take it over completely. Woof. Hard woof. This game is uh, dead. This is it's, uh, it's fucking dead. I'm gonna mute myself so that you can scream for the next five minutes. Are you ready? <sighs> I'm just gonna cry. I don't know that I'm gonna scream, Cayman. I was so excited for this game. One, I mean, I mean, this is like a top five game for me. And and to get a fully completely built from the ground up remake. And like this would be like an RE2. I, I was assuming this would be like an RE2 style remake where like it's not going to feel like the original because the original was made so long ago that like, you got to kind of start over. Yeah. And I, I'm just so disappointed by this. And like, especially toward the end where they were like, they spent all this time and money on a fucking vertical slice to only find out that like, Hey, the bosses ain't happy with it. And now we're three, three years behind schedule. It's like, what the fuck? How is this bungled so poorly? Do you want to know how it's bungled so poorly? Tell me asper media was the one who was doing it like this game needed an, an actual studio and not saying that they're not an actual studio but this game like the development for this game needed like a legitimate a legitimate built out studio that has worked on other projects because all it's they've like done big things yeah. yeah all they've done is remake old like and, and uh no let me rephrase that all they've done is remaster old games bring Import. things like like KOTOR 1 and KOTOR 2 port. That's the right word. Thank you. They've ported the original KOTORs, They've, which <laughs> you might remember me just a few weeks ago fucking screaming about the KOTOR 2 port being broken. Uh, I, that should have been a, a, a fucking uh, deer in headlights moment, but instead I was like, oh no, it's just this one. But yeah, I just... I'm, I'm not going to say that <sighs> Asper doesn't have talent. Asper just doesn't have the the bandwidth to pull a project like sure. this off. And the fact that like Sony got in to like start promoting it, just a shit look. Yeah. I, I, for the record, I think I don't, it doesn't really matter. I think it's a spire. Uh, uh, what did I say? Asper. Aspire. But like, you know, they're what? not going to exist after this is done. <laughs> I'm, and like, I, I know Saber Interactive, I know the name. I can't think of it off the top of my head what they've done, but I think they've done a lot of other like porting type stuff and like remaster type stuff. Smaller, smaller games. Smaller show. stuff. So like, I don't know. It's just, yeah, I think you're, I think you're spot on. I think this was too, potentially too big of a project for a studio who had never built a game like this before. Even though they've, they've worked a lot with Star Wars games, it's, it, it's different building a Star Wars game from the ground up than taking a game that had been released on a platform 15 years ago and just putting it on switch. Like that's a very different thing, you know, as two people who have never done anything in game development, but yeah, I'm just, I think for me, if this is just like so disappointing, this would be like if, if tomorrow we found out that the dead space remake was just dead, like they were just like, Oh, too bad. It's going to suck. So we're canceling it. Okay. Oh, it was such uh, a game. Yeah. Jump in. Here we go. A couple games that Saber has done Shaq Fu. A Legend Reborn. Um, they did uh, ports, a bunch of ports, a bunch of ports. I will say, good on them. Um, they did do the Evil Dead game, which I have enjoyed. Okay, um, that's it. But Shaq Fu, that is like famously one of the worst sequels to a game ever. Yeah, I mean, Saber is just kind of, I mean, they've, they've made games. I mean, they made NBA Playgrounds. Um, they made... Oh, do you remember the Ryan Reynolds film R.I.P.D.? 
<laughs> yes. Guess what? They made R.I.P.D. the game. Fuck me. Um, yeah. So. You know what? Actually, so to to jump off of what you said and add to it, you're like the the issue is Aspire. I think the issue is Embracer Group. Yeah, I mean, but yeah, that, no, that's Embracer Group has a ton of talent. They do. They have a they shit do. ton of talent. But like, they're just so big. Like, they are yeah. exorbitantly big. Yeah. That, like, quality. it makes sense that that something like this would end up fucking dying and like being a failure because they're doing so much. True. I agree. Fuck. I'm just. I know. That sucks. I'm so I'm so disappointed. I really hope that the. I will be shocked if we ever see this game at this point, but I really yeah. hope that it can find a new home and and make it to fruition <sighs> because it's such a special game. Like this could have been so fucking cool to have because I assume the remake would have been. I'd already said RE2, even like Final Fantasy VII, where like it's a completely new. Like I don't think this would have been like a a turn based uh, action style game like. Kotor one was. I think this would have been like a straight up like, like how Final Fantasy seven is like a combat driven, and now it's just fucking dead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a uh, goddamn shame. Here. A goddamn a damn shame fine indeed. shame. A goddamn Kamen. shame indeed. A goddamn fine shame. Uh, well, Cayman, we do have uh, some good news at least today, uh, and that is that Sony has given us a look at PSVR 2s user experience so they on the playstation blog today they showed a bunch of new pictures which let me pull this up and actually sh th throw this on the old screen as well so uh, uh who wrote this uh yasuo takahashi senior staff pr uh, product manager at sony interactive entertainment walked us through some changes today mainly that uh they have confirmed which you know this is for you Oculus folks, this is not a new thing, but they confirmed that PSVR 2 will have see-through view confirmed, meaning that you'll be able to keep your headset on and see around your surroundings. That's awesome. uh, there's also going to be a new broadcast feature with the PS5 HD camera, which I think means that like you'll be able to like Twitch stream your PSVR um, gameplay, which is cool. Uh, you can also, which is another, uh, I believe this is a, an Oculus uh, thing too, where you can customize your play area so you can set boundaries within your play space. Uh, which is cool. They're kind of showing it in this little video here. Um, and then there's another cool feature where uh, th this is the, the boundaries here. There's another cool feature where it's going to have uh, all VR games will have a um, cinematic mode as well so that you can essentially play it from what, the way that I interpreted it. And this will also work for your other games is you can like play it like you're in a movie theater, um, cool. which they did in, in the original PSVR, but it just didn't, didn't work very well. Like the, the fidelity wasn't very good. And with the improvements they've made in the, um, the cameras and screens here, I would think that the fidelity will probably be a lot better in this. Um, but you'll, I'm assuming you'll be able to like watch movies and stuff in there, which would be pretty cool. Um, and then they also said that launch date and details will be coming soon so you know not a whole lot here uh but we finally saw the controls which actually let me let me just let's just do a little close-up on those controls for a little bit because they look so much better yeah than... yeah so the controls look a lot like the vive um which is awesome because they they those are super comfortable and they work really well um also i like the headset more yeah. now too i can yeah. think the headset looks a lot better Ultimately, I think the, the PlayStation VR 2, what it comes down to for me is going to be how much does it cost and what games can I play on it? Yeah. Because I'm not going to be playing all of my non-VR games in VR. That just seems a little ludicrous. Maybe some games would be kind of cool like that, but like, no. Um, what I do want to see is just more games. Like, show me why I need to buy this system. For sure. Why I need to pay however much it's going to cost for it. Uh, outside of that, I really think like th this is cool that we get to see some more info on it. But ultimately, without any like launch details, I don't really think that this is like a slam dunk story. Yeah. Um, but it is worth noting because I do think that like this should entice some people uh, to get excited for it. Yeah, I, I will say a really interesting thing. So right after this came out, shortly after that, Oculus came out and they're raising the price of the Rift 2 by $100 in like three weeks, which is really weird. Like you don't see that often. People being like, hey, we're going to start charging you more. So now, so it's going to be $500 for Oculus. So now I'm really like 
is what's the price for PSVR two going to be? Like, is it going to be that five hundred or is it going to be more? So I'm a little, I'm a little concerned um, about that, uh, but we'll see. Um, so yeah, so hey, why don't we? Let's just I, the Black Panther thing is going to be quick. Let's just let's just quickly do Black Panther and then uh, and then let's go into Ubisoft. So uh, this is coming from from GameSpot. Uh, via Jeff Grubb, who we've talked about already on the show. Apparently, there's a Black Panther game in development at EA. Uh, reporter Jeff Grubb talked about the new game on his daily news show for GameSpot sister site, Giant Bomb. According to Grubb, it will be an open world, single player game, and something of an origin story. It takes place after the previous Black Panther has died, so players must take on the challenge of becoming the new Black Panther. It's very early in development, so no release window has been given. Uh, it has been codenamed Project Rainier and is coming from EA. And we also know that it's an open world game, I think. Maybe we don't, actually. Um, what Does this do anything for you, Cayman? Uh, do you want a, a game as Black Panther? I mean, I think that's awesome, but no. Oh, well, okay. I think that's awesome. Not from EA. Yeah, that also worries me about EA. Yeah, because I just feel like this thing is just going to be riddled with microtransactions and ultimately just be a game that is maybe really popular for about a week on Twitch and then no one ever talks about it again. Yeah, we we saw how fumbled the Avengers was with uh, Crystal Dynamics, and so I hope that that's not the same case here. But it's also it's it's weird that it kind of mimics the Black Panther two movie storyline in a way. Um, yeah, which is kind of odd, but but yeah. So if you're a, a fan of Black Panther, that's a thing. Uh, Cayman, yeah, you came to me this week. Oh boy, and you said something that I think is very interesting, and that I want to talk about. Mm -hmm. In that, so we learned this week, uh, and I'm going to kick it to you for the story. But we learned this week that Ubisoft has kind of delayed their next two like biggest titles. And so I want to ask the question, what the fuck is going on at Ubisoft? And should we be worried? So came and take it away. All right. So this comes from, guess who? Jason Schreier <laughs> over at Bloomberg. He says, Ubisoft Entertainment has delayed the next Assassin's Creed title, pushing it to February to the spring, uh, marking the second such setback in recent days for the French video game publisher. The new game, codenamed Rift, and is set in the Middle East, was originally planned as an expansion to 2020's Assassin's Creed Valhalla, but morphed into a standalone game in order to fill a hole in Ubisoft's thin release schedule for this fiscal year. Ubisoft's office in Bordeaux is leading development on the game and asked for more time because Rift is running far behind schedule, according to a person familiar with the company's plans. The delay will impact Ubisoft's balance sheet as the game moves from the company's current fiscal year, which ends in March, to the next. The game is now expected to be released in May-June period. A Ubisoft spokesperson didn't immediately have a comment. On Thursday, as part of its quarterly earnings call, Ubisoft said it had delayed its upcoming Avatar game in a quote-unquote smaller and unannounced premium title. That was a reference to Rift, the person familiar with the plan said, asking not to be identified discussing information that isn't public. Ubisoft hasn't yet announced the game, but said it will reveal more information on the future of Assassin's Creed in September. Avatar Frontiers of Pandora, based on the movie franchise in partnership with Disney, was expected to be released this fall, but is now pushed back until at least 2023. The two setbacks have a publish, leave the publisher with a weak lineup that includes just two potential blockbusters this fall. A Nintendo Switch exclusive in the Mario Plus Rabbids franchise scheduled for October, and a pirate game called Skull and Bones that has been through a difficult <laughs> development process. Yeah, you believe it. And was delayed several times before finally landing on a release date this November. Now, Patrick, let's do a quick breakdown of the releases since 2020. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. So, released. Watch Dogs Legion with a 70% on Metacritic in October 2020. Uh, Valhalla in November 2020 with an 84%. You also had Just Dance, Immortal Phoenix Rising, Far Cry 6, Riders Republic, Just Dance 2022. Um, Rainbow Six Extraction, and Roller Champions, which I completely forgot that game even existed. Yeah. Those are the games that they have released since October of 2022, ending in May, or excuse me, October of 2020, ending in May 2022. And then obviously coming this year, like we said, is going to be Mario plus Rabbids and Skull and Bones. <sighs> there are <laughs> some games in development 
one being the mobile division game, which I am very angry about because the team behind it is currently working on Avatar Frontiers of Pandora, which was just delayed. There's also the Assassin's Creed Infinity, which is games as a service that we have no clue when it's coming out. Assassin's Creed Rift, which was now just delayed. Splinter Cell Reboot, which we still don't know when that's coming out. A game called X Defiant. An untitled Star Wars game. And then the game that will 100% never come out, Beyond Good and Evil 2. Well, boy. (sighs) So, there's just a lot to unpack. Kayla in the chat wants to, she she asked the question, when do y'all think it's coming? Uh, I think referring to Rift. And I would assume this comes like mid next year. Like, I I don't think this has probably been pushed out too far. I would think if you know, if they just need a little bit more time, then I, I doubt it's going to, because especially they've talked about how this is going to be a lot smaller of an experience, m- more like the original games than Valhalla origins uh, or, or Odyssey. So I don't expect the delay to be super long for that, but like looking at those games, Legion Valhalla, just dance two times, far cry six, immortal physics, Phoenix rising riders, Republic just dance, Rainbow Six Extraction, uh, Roller Champions, like none of those are hitters. Like none of those are were a huge hit. Games Probably that normally the best they are, had was Valhalla, but even yeah. that wasn't like me, some, who is a yeah. huge Assassin's Creed fan. I, I mean, I did devour that game. I played it for like 120 hours, but it felt very much like you can tell this is a game being worked on by like a thousand people across the world. Like there just wasn't a lot of heart in the game. Uh, it's just like, go do this, 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 go do this. And, and I, I remember a few years ago, there was this kind of feedback from the, uh, the audiences of Assassin's Creed. It's like, Hey, why do you keep releasing games every year? And they just keep getting kind of progressively worse. And they're like, they straight up were like, you keep buying. And then sales weren't as good for Valhalla. So they took a little bit of time. And, but it's like when you look at all of the games that they've done and the, the games that they're now working on, if these is, if Assassin's Creed Infinity doesn't pan out, I don't expect Avatar Frontiers of Pandora to be a hit. Like it could be. Like you said, Beyond Good and Evil 2, I will be shocked if that game ever comes out. We don't know what the untitled Star Wars game is. I've I actually have never heard of X Defiant. I don't know what that is. It's like you guys have 52 game studios across the world. 11 games in three years might sound like a lot, but when you think about the fact that it's 52 companies, it's not really. It's like, what is happening? Like, when is, you know what I mean? Like, I'm really excited for Sparks of Hope, but as you've said, like, that's more of a Nintendo game than a Ubisoft game. Yeah. I um I mean we we talked about a few weeks ago when we were actually on the um the JK Games podcast. We actually discussed very briefly, but we discussed the fact that Yves Gilmont uh forwent his bonus this year. Yeah, uh, because he didn't hit numbers that they should have hit. Ultimately, I don't no it's not looking good for Ubisoft. The the question I think shouldn't be asking is what the fuck is happening at Ubisoft. It's who is going to buy Ubisoft. Yeah. You know, they fought sure. off NVIDIA from being bought out by them. And we all rooted for them, pulling for them. I don't know if that has anything to do with what's going on now, but whatever is happening there, they need to restructure. Maybe they need to start cutting down some of those 52 studios. I know that sucks to say because there's real human beings working there. Yeah, for sure. And and presumably working on projects, but like maybe they need new leadership at, at, at Ubisoft. Maybe they need to be bought out. And I hate even saying that, but like ultimately this is not a good place to be in for a company this big. Yeah, for sure. And if I'm someone working at Ubisoft right now, I'm terrified about what's going to happen to the company as a whole. Because this this is not sustainable. Now, sure, you know the games sell, but like you're you're supporting 52 studios and only yeah. 11 games in three years. You're not making enough to be able to keep those studios alive. Um, this is not this is not a good place. I, I could see easily we saw potentially dumping some studios or letting some studios be bought out by other companies. You know, you might see them try to sell some off to. Uh, to Sony or Microsoft, 
ultimate, you know, you or potentially what could end up happening is, is you have another situation like Embracer Group coming in and just swooping up like a few smaller studios from them. And like, hey, let me get, let us get them off your hands. Or you have another huge corporation like Tencent that comes in and it's like, you have no choice but to take our offer or your company will not exist in, in, in a few more years. Um, the only way that I see them making a bounce back is if Assassin's Creed Infinity is like a massive hit, like Destiny style. Like it has to be one of the largest games to come out in the in the last decade. Sure. Like it has to be that level to, and be able to continue to bring in and have support because you know Destiny's been able to survive. I mean, they're a billion dollar company. Like that's that's the only way that you could that I I I see this going just from a business yeah. standpoint because they're bloated. Ubisoft is bloated, and production wise, it's not good. This is yeah, this is I'm, bad. Yeah, I'm Real so bad. shocked. Like, and, and it's like it's so interesting because they they used to have a lot more franchises, things like Splinter Cell, which they're finally bringing back, and I it, it just so many of their studios got re like moved to work on things like. Assassin's Creed so that there's like a 24 hour cycle of, of the game being worked on. And when you put all your eggs in one basket, if that basket's not going to pan out. Yeah, it's not good. Patrick, I don't like it. I don't like it one bit, especially because like I know Assassin's Creed gets a lot of hate in the last few years. And a lot of it, I think, is warranted. Uh, let me rephrase that. Hate is never warranted. Criticism is warranted sometimes uh, when it's, you know, when they need to be criticized. And I'm a huge Assassin's Creed fan and I will be so bummed if, if this ends up dying, but I see, you know, here's the thing for me. I don't think we'll see it die. Sure. I, I don't foresee any of these IP splinter cells, especially Assassin's Creed beyond good and evil too. I mean, there's only been, it's not like it's a series. <laughs> it's that not game, really alive at this point. Well, no, I, I would be shocked to know if anyone has actually put any effort or work towards this game in the last six years. <laughs> um, I mean, that's just the truth. Prove I mean, us like, wrong, Ubisoft. That is a challenge, Eves. Eves Uh, But no, like I feel like this is another one where it's like, oh, sinking ship, we need to make money. Yeah. And that money, like you might have to sell some of this stuff off. So you might have to sell something like Splinter Cell off. But... Yeah. At this point, I think the big thing here that I think that we should all keep our eyes on is all of the sharks swimming around. Because I, I feel someone like... will swoop in soon if this if this doesn't get any better in the next year. I feel like the big wild card on the board right now for them is Avatar Frontiers of Pandora. Like when the original movie came out, it was like the biggest thing on the planet. And it, it, it's over the last 10 years, it's gotten a lot of kind of revisionist history in a way of people not like thinking it's trash because at the time, like it was people were seeing that movie 19 times. People were killing themselves because they couldn't live in Pandora. I'm not making that up. That's a real story. Jeez. And yeah, that, that really happened um, because the world was so colorful and they could, they knew that they would never get to live in Pandora. I and hate everything. And so this is 2009, 2010. So like, it, you know, it was 12 years ago, but if, James Cameron's bet is is right and and Avatar becomes a huge thing again. Maybe this game is the next big thing. Maybe it ends up being huge. I don't think it will be, but it could be. Because it's so interesting to me how they've pivoted so so much away from the division and now it's just a mobile game because I felt like the division was like they're one of their biggest franchises. And now that's the team working on Avatar Frontiers of Pandora making a first person Avatar game. So it's like I don't know. It's just so weird. Like it's all very weird. But if that if that bet can pan out, I bet a lot of this is maybe not solved, but it probably looks a lot better. So that's the really big question mark for me: is Avatar: Frontiers of Pandora. Um, but I guess we'll have to wait and see, Kevin. I don't. I don't. I don't like any of it. Yeah, it makes me feel bad inside, Patrick. <sighs> I just I just want to be held after after the. <sighs> After the Kotor story and now this, you're feeling bad. I'm feeling bad. I just want to, I just want someone to come and, and hug me and snuggle me. Ease, come on. I'm looking at you. I'm looking at you. 
let us know what you think uh, about Ubisoft. If you have any thoughts, opinions, if, if, you know, if you're currently working on beyond good and evil Two, send me a copy of anything. It could be a trailer. It could be an asset. I just want to know that it's a real thing. Um, but Cayman, that's our show. That is as always, thanks for coming along on the ride. Uh, you can always get it by subscribing to our Twitch, twitch.tv slash Spotlight Games Pod, or you can subscribe to our YouTube channel to see it after the fact. Or you can always search for Spotlight Games in the podcast app of your choice. Subscribe there. Give us a rating. Give us a comment. Give us a review. Whatever it does on the platform, uh, do it. Um, Save Share Cinema, newest episode out this week. We're going to have another spicy one next week. Give that a shake a lake. Shock a lock. Uh, if you know what I'm saying. Uh, this has been the Spotlight Games Podcast. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, we love you. We appreciate you, Cayman. Thank you, as always, for being my sweet dumpster boy. Bye-bye. Oh, bye-bye.